Hi, this is Sholy Physics, episode on determining the moment of inertia. I'm also going to throw in some parallel axis theorem. If you've ever uh, taken a baseball bat or softball bat, you'll notice that one end is a little bit bigger than the other. And you're supposed to hold it by the handle and swing it like, you know, this. So you're rotating it sort of around its, its end, around the end of that rod of sorts. Also hold a pencil up. And you can uh, take the pencil and wiggle it sort of like this. You're rotating around at its end. But you also notice if you take that baseball bat and flip it upside down and, and hold it by the big part of the bat and swing it, it feels a little bit different. It feels a little less heavy. Um, likewise, if you take your pencil, wiggle it about the end, and now wiggle it through the center, you find it's it's a little bit faster. You can you can move it more quickly. It feels a little lighter when you twist it like this. There's this weird feeling that the uh, that changes whenever you change the position on that rotating object. Sometimes you might have encountered a lightweight door or a heavy door that you're trying to get into a room. Um, big heavy mass doors are harder to open than the lighter kind of empty hollow doors that are normally on most houses. So, you know, big oaken doors, you go to an old mansion or something like that, you might encounter those. So every time you twist or rotate an object, you feel something different. That's called the moment of inertia. That object, all those little pieces of mass on the door, on the pencil, on the baseball bat, those are masses that tend to remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So in rotation, if you think about those pieces of mass, the pieces of mass on the outside, when they're rotated, have to travel a, a further distance than the pieces of mass on the inside. So in essence, those outer pieces of mass have to accelerate faster than the inner pieces of mass. Let's consider a rod. And this rod could also be like a, a top-down view of a door. A door rotates about its end. A rod rotates about its end. A bat is swung about its end. So this would be like this kind of system here. All right, there we go. So this is our rod. And it has a moment of inertia I, and that's what we're really trying to figure out. Um, you might have explored already how different um, systems have a moment of inertia, like for a rod about its end. You've seen in a textbook somewhere that the moment of inertia is one-third ml squared. Or what if you have that rod and you rotate it about the center? It, it's now a one-twelfth ml squared. Or, or a, a disc or a, a cylinder. What If it's a solid cylinder, you rotate it, it has a dimension r. Um, its moment of inertia is one half m r squared. So the big question is where do these come from? That's what this presentation is about, where those fractions come from. So let's move it back just a little bit. All right. If we have a very lightweight rod, very lightweight rod, and axis of rotation about the end there. So we're, we're free to rotate this rod this way or, or that way, either way. You feel this moment of inertia, and it's very, very easy to, to twist. It's a very lightweight rod. What if we put now a very large mass on it, big M, and it's located a distance R away from that rotation axis? Its moment of inertia is M R squared. All that mass is located at position R. So why is it R squared? Well, experimentally, if you slide that R outward to the end, the moment of inertia out here is four times greater than it is when it's when the mass is at this position. The mass of the system didn't change, only the positioning of that mass, that large mass, did change. So if we double the R, it turns out to quadruple the moment of inertia. It's four times more difficult to rotate about the end when a mass is out at the end compared to when it's halfway in. You can also try this out on a merry-go-round. If you get on one of those merry-go-rounds with your, you and your friends, you get spinning, and you move from the outside to the inside, it's a lot easier for someone to rotate the merry-go-round when you're closer towards the inside. Or if you stand at the very middle of the merry-go-round and someone rotates it, all I've got to work against there is the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round because you are at the very center at an R of zero. There's just a few different scenarios there. 
So this is experimentally determined. I is equal to mr squared for a point mass, for a mass that's at a certain point. Okay? So let's consider that. I equals mr squared for just a point mass. Now, what about the rod? Let's focus just on a solid rod here. This is not a small insignificant, insignificant mass rod. This is a rod of uniformly distributed mass. And that's kind of an important point. It has a mass M that's uniformly distributed. So this is this is not a baseball bat distributed. <laughs> All right, this is not a baseball bat where it has a big heavy end and a, and a small handle. Okay, this is just a uniformly distributed mass rod. And it has a length L. Length L mass M. Okay, if you think about that rod now and relate it to the point mass, what is a rod? but a series of small pieces of mass stuck together in a very uniform manner, okay? So if this is our rotation axis, you can consider there's a little slice right here that is a distance r away from that center of mass. There's a little slice right here that's a bigger distance r. There's another piece out here, it's a bigger distance r. And so you have this series of of, of little pieces of mass that make up this entire rod and they're all a different radius away. They're all different distance away from that rotation axis. Um, now if we blow this up a little bit more, I'm going to make this a, a cylindrical rod. All right, nice big cylindrical rod. And again, this is our, our rotation axis here on the end. In this scenario, I'm also going to look at some ro rotation axes in different spots. I'm also going to look at one through the center of mass. It's going to be a little bit later on. But first, let's consider this one scenario. If we take a little slice of that, if you ever go to the, the deli at the supermarket and, um, and ask for pepperoni, they'll take out this long thing that looks sort of like this. It looks like a long rod. And if they slice it, it gives you a little slice of pepperoni. That's what you can think of here. It's a little slice taken out right here, all right? So if this little slice is a piece of mass, we're gonna call that dm, all right? A little piece of mass dm, right? as opposed to the overall mass big M here, all right? This is a little slice dm, and it makes up a small little piece of the moment of inertia, di, such that if we add up all these little pieces of these little slices, I'm calling them pepperoni. If we add up all the pepperonis, we get the total moment of inertia of this rod, right? Well, if we have an I equals mr squared, what would di be? But the dm located at r, it would have moment of inertia dm r squared, that little di. The R is not what's changing here. It's not a small piece. The R is the location of dm that makes up the little piece of moment of inertia di. And to figure out the moment of inertia of the entire rod, we're going to have to add up all the little slices from the zero, from zero distance, out to a distance l. We're going to have to sum them up to make the total moment of inertia. So from this, we get an expression that allows us to really analyze any system that might be rotating and find its moment of inertia, i. If we sum up all the little di's, we get i, the total moment of inertia of that system. And that's going to be equal to the integral of r squared dm. Now, this r, I'm going to call it a little r, because r would generally, if we're talking about a big object, R would be the, the radius of that big object, like a disk. Or in this case, you could say L is R. It's relating to a radial distance from the inner part where the, where the rod rotates out to the outside. So that could be a big R. 
I'm going to call it a little r because each of these little dms has its own r value. You could say r1 or r2. But if you think about it, these are infinitely small slices. So there's an infinite number of little tiny slices of dm. This is our expression that we're working with and its origin. Okay. So let's apply it to the rod now. Where's that one third ml squared for the rod come from? This mass, this rod has a mass L or mass M and length L. All right. And to specify the rotation axis, just give us a little, little picture here. We're going to focus on a little slice, one little slice here, dm, that's located at a distance r. Okay. When using this expression, I think this is the, the quirkiest part of the process. What the heck is dm? As you see here, it should involve r, or, or inversely, we need to put dm in terms of a little piece of dr, a little piece of that r value. See this slice, if you can imagine, has a tiny, tiny, tiny width. And we can call it little tiny width dr. What we're getting into here is a need of a relationship between mass and the physical dimension of this rod that takes up space. So what is a relationship between mass and that quantity that takes up space called volume? Mass over volume is density. Density is mass over volume. So if we consider for this rod that has mass m, what is its volume in terms of the length l? Uh, this particular rod that I drew here looks sort of like a cylinder. So it might be the volume of a cylinder is pi times its cross-sectional radius squared times the length. But I'm just going to call it A. This is the cross-sectional area of the rod. That cross-sectional area could be a square, it could be a rectangle. Um, during the holidays, there's this kind of chocolate treat that you could buy at supermarkets. It comes in this like triangular cylinder shape. I think it's called like Toblerone or something like that. All right, it tastes pretty good. I just never, I can never pronounce it. So what is the volume of this, this object? It could, it's gonna be the cross-sectional area times the length. That's the, the density. So why am I doing this? Well, it's because if you think about like a, a block of wood of uniform density, if you cut that block of wood in half and then measure its mass divided by its volume and compare that to the, vol to the density of the whole block before you cut it, its bigger mass divided by its bigger volume, you should get exactly the same density value. That's how we can identify um, substances by, by their density, because no matter what size they are, if you measure mass and divide by volume, it should be the same, it should be uniform. Uh, therefore, the density of this entire rod should be equal to the density of the little tiny slice, right? So that slice will have a mass, dm, but what would its volume be? Well, if I take volume of this little tiny slice, a uh, slice of, of volume would be dv, right? A little piece dv. It makes up the entire thing. So if I add up all the dvs, uh, integral of dv would be v, would be the total volume of the object. Well, volume is a times the length. Then if I Take a derivative here. What, what changes as I'm going out here? What dimension is changing as I go from slice to slice to slice? I'm actually going out a little tiny change dr. So a dr, this would be the, um, you can think of this like taking the derivative 
and thinking about what's, what's changing here. As, as I get a little change in, in DV, the A stays the same, but I do get a little change in length. So the, the, the DR is sort of like the, the width or the height of the cylinder, and A is the cross-sectional area. This would give me the volume of that little pepperoni, A DR. So if I now substitute that in here for the volume of the pepperoni, I get a D A DR. And this is the expression that's going to unlock the value of dm. You see, we now we're now going to have if we sub if we solve for dm, we're going to have something in terms of dr, which relates to r squared. This is going to make this integral solvable. I'm going to pull these out and do some algebra magic here. Adr. If you multiply both sides by a, that a cancels out, and then let's move it down a little bit. We get an m over l equals dm over dr, and we now multiply both sides by dr. So now we know what dm is equal to. dm is equal to m over l dr. I'm going to go to a new page here and rewrite this now. I equals integral of r squared dm. We're now going to substitute dm, which is m over l dr. There it is. Let's clean that up now. We'll bring the constants to the front, and we get an r squared dr back here. We're trying to find the exact moment of inertia for this rod of mass m and length dl. To get an exact value, we need to do a definite integral. Let's once again think about this rod. If this is the rotation axis about the end, has a length L, mass M. Then, if we're looking at this little slice dm located at r, we're going in this direction from zero. We need to figure out what, uh, what our r's are gonna be. We're gonna sum up all these little pepperonis and their moments of inertia from zero distance out to the length L. So our integral becomes, so about the end, an axis about the end of the rod. We would integrate from zero to a length L for that R dimension. And we're now ready to go. There's our definite integral, m over l, and the integral of r squared dr is r cubed over three. And we're gonna take that from the limit of zero to l. Plug in an l, l cubed over three, minus plug in a zero, zero cubed over three. And what do we get? We get an m over l times l cubed over three. There's zero right there. Uh, one of these l's cancels out to get a squared. m l squared and what's left is a one-third. There it is. One-third m l squared. That's where it comes from. From our initial set, one third ml squared is a rod with its axis about the end. So how about this one twelfth? Is that gonna be much different? Do I have to start this all over? No, absolutely not. Don't need to start it over. For the axis about the center, we'll go ahead and say center of mass. It's gonna come into to play here in a moment. 
So what about the center of mass? Let's consider that now. My axis now goes to that center. If this whole thing is length L, then what do we integrate from? We can actually borrow from this expression up here. I equals, everything else is the same up to this point. M over L, R squared dr. But we're gonna be going from to the left of the zero point to the right of the zero point. And what is this length here? It's, it's an L over two. We're gonna start at negative L over two. We're gonna integrate over to this end to a positive L over two. We're gonna add up all those little slices to the left of the zero point and to the right of the zero point. So negative L over two to positive L over two. And that gets us this result down here. So from negative L over two to positive L over two. So this is really where we can pick it up. You don't have to do anything before that. This algebra is a little bit more cumbersome. But very easy nonetheless. So I have a mass, mass over length. Now we'll substitute L halves to the third power over three minus negative L halves to the third power over three. And L halves to the, uh, to the third power is L cubed over eight. Now what I'll do, I'll, just to make this a little easier for now, I'm gonna factor out a three. So factor out a one third, sorry. Factor out a one third and put that three down here in the denominator. That just leaves us um, L over two to the third power minus a negative L over two to the third power. Uh, so inside here, we're gonna have L cubed over two cubed is eight minus Negative L over two is to the third power is negative L cubed over eight. All right, negative times a negative is a positive, so we're gonna add those up. We got a M over three L, I factored out that three, that, that one third. And on the inside here, we're gonna have a L cubed over eight plus L cubed over eight. That's two L cubed over eight. And finally, we'll simplify. We have one of these L's canceling. It makes a squared value there, L squared. And so we've got an M L squared. And a two divided by 24 is the same as, here we go, 1 12th. There it is, right about the middle. 1 12th ml squared. Okay, so these 1 thirds, these 1 twelfths, they're coming just from the, the limits that we put on where, where the parallel, sorry, where the axis is that this uh, object is free to spin about. So the moment of inertia of, let's say, a door is different depending on where that, where that axis is. Now, usually on the door, it's about the end. I encourage you to try this process for a door. It actually turns out to be the same as the rod. You just got to think about the dimension there that matters. So in a kind of midway conclusion to this presentation here, we got one third ml squared and one twelfth ml squared. Don't they seem related somehow? You know, the, the distance between the two axes is half the length, L over two, half the length. And if L is a squared, what's one half squ squared? One half squared is one fourth. Look at the difference between these two. One twelfth is one fourth of one third. There's a connection here. And that connection is what the parallel axis theorem describes. And take a little break here from determining moments of inertia. And I'm going to give you the parallel axis theorem, IP equals ICM plus 
m d squared. This is called the parallel axis theorem. I'll explain it. All right. We just looked at two scenarios, one where the axis was through the end and one where the axis was through the center of mass. We're going to call this the ICM and this one the IP. This axis about the end is parallel to that through the center of mass. And there's a relationship between them. That's what this is about. Let's say we have one, but not the other. How can we determine the other? Well, I just went through the, all that integration and such to figure out first the moment of inertia about the end. So let's say this one's given. One third ml squared is the moment of inertia for this rod of mass m and length l. What is the moment of inertia through the center mass? Now, in a different way, we already determined that to be 1 12th. Let's see how this parallel axis theorem also gives us 1 12th. All right. The ICM is identified by which one goes through the center of mass. Now, this theorem does not work if we try to compare ICM to, let's say, an axis along its length. Those two axes, this one along its length and the one through the center mass, they're not parallel. So the parallel axis theorem doesn't work for those two. However, for the axis through the end, these two axes are parallel. Therefore, we can apply this here. So since we already know the parallel axis, moment of inertia of one third ml squared, we can use that to try to find the moment of inertia through the center mass. So what is this over here? That's, that's really what this one's all about. M times D. D is the distance between the center mass and the parallel axis. It would be this distance. In this scenario, that distance is half the length. So what we would plug in here is half the length for the value of D. Now don't forget to square it. And that's all it is. D is the distance between the parallel axis and the center of mass axis. Let's simplify a little bit. We're going to solve for ICM. This is going to be m times l squared. I always leave space for the fraction there. And 1 half squared is 1 fourth. So to figure out the ICM, we're going to have to subtract 1 fourth ml squared from both sides. So I'll have a one third ml squared still all over here, minus one fourth ml squared. Let's find a common denominator. Three and four both go into 12. Three goes into 12 four times. And four goes into 12 three times. I forgot my L squared over here. Let's clean that up. So what's our result? 4 twelfths ml squared minus 3 twelfths ml squared. Surprise, surprise, is 1 twelfth ml squared. All right, moments of inertia through the center mass. Uh, one more example, and this one's a bit funkier. This is a kind of a reason for the parallel axis theorem. We just showed that it works. So how about through a thin-walled hollow sphere? If you look up the ICM for a thin walled hollow sphere, it's two thirds m times radius squared. R is the radius of the sphere. Okay. This is a thin walled sphere. Hollow. Okay, none of the mass is toward the center, it's all pushed to the outside. Two thirds m r squared. There it is. So what if we wanted to shift this axis over to the end? So it's no longer just spinning on its axis, but it's more wobbling around its edge. That's the, the situation we got here. Those axes are parallel, so the parallel axis theorem applies. IP equals ICM plus MD squared.
and we're looking for IP, the parallel axis here. The hollow sphere's moment of inertia through its center mass axis is two thirds mR squared. And we're going to move it over a distance equal to the radius. Substitute R for D. That's what I did there. So out of that, we get a two thirds mR squared. And we need a common denominator of one third. So this will be three thirds mR squared. Two thirds plus three thirds is five thirds. There's our new moment of inertia. You might be like, oh, it's greater than one. Yeah, all that mass is shifted out away. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at this now, uh, when does this sphere become a point mass? <laughs> if this is the original center mass and we keep on moving the sphere further and further out this way, that's the distance d and this is r you can see that as d gets greater and greater and greater and greater all right this term becomes more significant and this term over here becomes less significant d increases but r doesn't so if r is really small let's say r is 1 but d is 10 what's 2 thirds m times 1 squared compared to m times 10 squared. It'd be like 100 compared to 2 thirds. All right, it becomes less and less significant. And take a look. We end up uh, becoming the, the point mass moment of inertia as this thing gets further and further away. So the parallel axis theorem helps us get a, a limit as, as an object gets further and further out from the center. When does it become a point mass? It's when this term here becomes so insignificant compared to this term. There it is. All right, as a bonus feature, at the end of this video, I'm going to work on the moments of inertia for a cylinder for, or a solid disk. Our result should be 1 half mR squared. That's what a, my textbook tells me. So where does that come from? We're gonna start with integral of R squared dm. All right, so here's our disk, radius big R, mass M. All right, in this case, we need to think of a, a symmetric piece of mass. If we go at a distance R from the center, little r now, go a distance little r, there's a piece of mass right here. We might call that dm, but you might notice that this makes sort of a, a ring around where all the little pieces of mass in that ring will have the same distance little r so if we go from like the center to the outside and add up the moments of inertia of all these little rings that's going to give us our total moment of inertia our first job is to figure out what dm is so let's go to density Always write it out. It might give you a good starter. What's the mass of this disk? M. What's the volume? Okay, the volume would be, uh, well, it's a, it's a disk kind of thing, so it has a, has a size to it. There's an edge. That's a horrible edge, okay? So if, let me just redraw this from the side. This is more what it looks like. Kind of like a hockey puck. Okay, so there's a, I don't call this a, a distance D or depth D. Um, the volume is gonna be the area of this circle with a big R, pi big R squared times D. Okay. Well, what about DM? What about this ring? It's going to have a volume, basically just a piece of that. What's the piece of that volume going to be? 
Again, we don't want to use big R here, but we want to use little r because for that little section, what would, a, what would a ring slice of this thing be? Kind of like a smaller puck, but more of a shell as we're moving outwards. We get a two if we integrate with respect to r. Sorry, we take the derivative. Take the derivative with respect to r. We get a two r times pi d. Okay, derivative uh, derivative of two r is the derivative of r squared is two r. And uh, it's not just 2r, but it's 2r dr, okay? 2r dr is the derivative of that side. So pi and d, these are both, pi is a constant, d staying the same. So for every little uh, section slice, little shell, hockey puck shell within this thing, it's around like that. Each of those shells will have a distance, or a depth d. Each of those shells will have a depth d. All this is hard to say. But our d our dv is two pi r dr, and I can't forget that little d in there. That depth. All right. Nice thing is it's going to cancel out here. Another way to look at this, just to just to make sure I'm not glossing over things too much. Um, Let's see if this shell idea makes sense for volume. This hockey puck shell inside. What's the volume of this thing? Well, the volume, it's a very, very ultra thin kind of disc around this. So that, that volume, the one dimension is two pi r. It's a circle times a depth. So volume is, is three dimensional, okay? This is only two dimensions so far. I've got the ring and I've got the depth, but what about the width of the ring? We need the volume of the width of the ring. Well, that the volume of the width of that ring is a tiny, tiny slice dr. It's a little tiny distance of depth, infinitesimally small going outward from the center dr. So there are three dimensions. The ring times its depth times its slight, slight, tiny, tiny width. 2 pi r dr times d. Just to verify, that's two ways to look at this. Um, this might be a little sketchy, taking the derivative. Is that going to give it to you? Yeah, it's going to give you that, that little slice there. All right. So in all this, we have a couple of things that will cancel. A pi cancels. A d cancels but notice this big r is for the entire volume of the disc this little r is the distance to each little dr so those don't cancel and i've got an m over r squared to get this cleaned up looking equals dm over 2r dr two little r dr so we now have dm is equal to 2mr dr divided by big R squared. Whew. Tough part done. I'm going to bring this to the next page. 2mr dr over R squared. over big R squared. And we're ready to apply it to the integral. dm, we're going to substitute all this in. 2 big M R dr over R squared. Now, we need a definite integral here. Okay, at this point, if you've got a solid disk, we're going to sum up all the little rings from the zero, from the center, outward to the outside, all the way to R. So our limits are going to be from zero to R. But I want to say here, if you want to try this out on the thick wall cylinder, that's also one that tends to be in te textbooks, 
with the thick wall cylinder, you have an R1, a radius 1, and a radius 2. And all the mass is between R1 and R2. So if that's the case, you might put an R1 as this limit and R2 as this one. Integrate from R1 to R2. That's how you could work this one out. All right, but in this scenario, we're just going from the center all the way to the outside, zero to R. We're going to sum up all that those little DIs as we go from the center all the way to the outside. All right, we have a few. I'm going to clean this up first. We can combine some like terms, R squared times R. So we're going to have a 2 big M divided by big R squared times R cubed dr. Integrate, keep the constant out. Integral of uh, r to the r, r to the third power, r cubed, is r to the fourth power over four. And we're gonna go from zero to r. Big R to the fourth over four minus zero to the fourth over four. So that'll give us two M R to the fourth power over four R squared. See two of those R's will cancel and two fourth is the same as one half. We get a one half M R squared. There it is hidden within the solid disk. I hope this is helpful, especially if you have to do some of these on your own for homework. What I recommend is doing this process on your own. Maybe copy this down, then try it out on your own without looking at anything. See if you can come up with the DM, plug it in, and come up with your result here. You know the answers. You can look them up in a book. But just this process is what you're trying to learn here. And I hope this is helpful. 